Giles Brandreth, friend of the royals who met the Queen on several occasions. His new biography offers insight into the intimate life of Queen Elizabeth, including how she dealt with the death of her own beloved husband, Philip. I spoke to him about his new book, and he paid his own tribute to the late Queen Elizabeth. Uh, Giles Brandreth, your latest book is about friendship, it's about love, it's about working together, but also it does exactly what it says on the title page. It is an intimate portrait. That's what I wanted to achieve. A couple of days before the Queen's death, I happened to be at Windsor Castle in the Royal Library. And there they showed me a portrait of Elizabeth I. First of all, a reminder that we've had a, a royal family in this country for more than a thousand years. And they said to me, this portrait of Elizabeth I, it was one that she sent to her brother, Edward VI. They were both the children of King Henry VIII. And with the portrait went a letter from Elizabeth I, written in her beautiful handwriting, in which she said, I'm sending you this outward image of myself, but I would love to share with you my inward mind. And I thought to myself, I'm writing this book, wouldn't it be wonderful to try and reveal to people the inward mind of Elizabeth II? We all know what she looked like, but what was she really like? And since I was lucky enough to meet her many years ago, first time was the 2nd of May 1968, I can give you the date because I keep a diary, and she won't have remembered the people that she met, <laughs> most of them, because she met tens of thousands of people, but anyone who ever met the Queen can remember that moment. And because I keep a diary, I've, I kept a record of all my encounters with the Queen, and they were many over the years. From that first encounter, when I was a student, aged 20, at Oxford University, she was 42, uh, she came, and the first thing I noticed was how the atmosphere in the room changed. Nobody was ever normal with the Queen. There was a kind of invisible moat around her, and yet she was always normal herself. She was always herself. But everybody else responded in a different way. The other thing I noticed on that first day was I reprimanded the president of the Union, uh, William Waldegrave, who was a couple of years older than me, uh, because we were going into the Oxford Union. He uh, wasn't carrying her umbrella. It was raining. And I said to him, you should have carried the Queen's umbrella. He said, oh, no, no. Her Majesty insists on carrying her own umbrella. Otherwise, the rain trickles down her neck. <laughs> so I wanted to write a book that showed you what she was really like. I, I think you have done that, but it also touches upon another very, very serious point. This relationship began with the late Duke of Edinburgh, and that was as a result of shared interests and working. It wasn't court frippery or queuing up at some line up to shake hands and be introduced. This was you and him caring passionately about something that very few people would have thought of immediately as being a shared passion between the late Duke of Edinburgh and Charles Brandreth. Well, I have met the Duke of Edinburgh because I got involved in a charity called the National Playing Fields Association, now Fields in Trust. And the reason the Duke of Edinburgh was involved is that it was founded by the Queen's father who became George VI when he was Duke of York in the 1920s. And it was to look after playing fields, playgrounds, recreation, sport for young people. And the Duke of Edinburgh took it on as his first national charity when he married Princess Elizabeth back in 1947. And it was his passion project. And I became involved and got to meet him and found he was a very different person from the caricature that uh, you know most of us got to know. And he asked me to write a short biography of him, which I did, which was quite challenging because I had to take it into him and he had to, you know, he corrected it and it was all a bit frightening. But through him, I got to meet the Queen and then later when I was a Member of Parliament, I got to meet the Queen officially. And to see their relationship was fascinating at close hands. They weren't lovey-dovey in the modern way. There are no photographs anywhere of the Queen and Prince Philip holding hands or kissing, but they were, well, they were a team. What was extraordinary about the Queen is when she made a commitment, she kept to it. I think one of the reasons that people were so moved when she died wasn't simply our longest serving monarch, wasn't simply to see somebody whose commitment was, was so real over so many years, was that clearly he was a rather unusual person. In a dark world, you watch the news, you know, see what's happening in Ukraine, you think, actually, here's somebody who was good. And I felt at the time of the funeral, people were almost reaching out to touch that goodness, whatever generation they were. Somebody was consistent, kind, kept their word. 
And uh, her marriage to Prince Philip was extraordinary. And she accepted him for who he was. And I think they accepted each other for who they were. You are one of the most well-read people I know. And you've written a number of, of really impressive biographies and, and, and books about the royal family. Were there lines in producing this that you imposed upon yourself that you could not cross? That there were restrictions that you placed upon that because you had had that intimate and private access over the years? That was quite a challenge because I didn't want to put particularly ladies-in-waiting, people who'd been around them, in a difficult position. By And I didn't want to quote anybody anonymously. So that was the challenge. I decided not to show the book to uh, living members of the royal family before publishing it, which I did with my Duke of Edinburgh book, for two reasons. One, I thought, actually, I don't think they'll want to read it. The reason I say that is that somebody told me that they had, when the film The King's Speech came out, which was rather a moving film about George VI and his speech impediment, somebody said to the Queen, it's a wonderful film, you should see it. And she said, well, why would I want to? It's about my parents. I knew them. And uh, this is a book for people who don't know the Queen to show her to you. So that maybe people who did know her, why, why would you want to read it? Well, there are a number of revelations, as it were, within it, and, and, and it's been serialised in one of the newspapers as well as being uh, available. And I thoroughly recommend people to get a copy of it and read it from cover to cover. Perhaps the most shocking revelation is that the death certificate says that she died of old age. Not so. I don't think it's shocking. I felt I was writing a, a biography. Uh, and it has to go from birth to death. And so I was simply reporting that I had heard that she had uh, a form of um, a bone marrow cancer. And, uh, but I wasn't surprised. Indeed, I predicted that the death certificate would say old age because when a patient is over the age of about 80 and when the person signing the death certificate has been their doctor for not some years, that is one of the options that is open to them. And indeed, that was the case uh, with the Duke of Edinburgh. So I, I, I felt, as a reporter, because it is a biography, I should put what I knew on the page. Uh, but you're right. Are you intruding on people's privacy? And in a sense, I am, because I'm quoting from conversations with the Queen, which I would not have done during her lifetime. Um, but I've done it because I wanted people to know People, I think, did know how compassionate she was and also how sharp she was, but they maybe didn't realise what a wry sense of humour she had. We got a flavour of that when we got, the, most recently, only earlier this year, you know, the, the Jubilee, the wonderful Paddington Bear sketch. But she did have this wonderful sense of uh, humour and she had a side to her which we didn't often see. She was a, quite a shy person, I think. And as happens sometimes with actors who are shy, they come to life on the stage. And I did have an interesting conversation with her about the war years. And she talked about her father during the war. Uh, the father, her father was a really important person in her life. Uh, and incidentally, the anniversary of his death, he died from cancer, she would um, always, almost always, uh, on that particular day or around then, visit a cancer hospital or a hospice. She was very aware of that all her life. So for her, the war years, her father at Windsor, her father leading the country, Winston Churchill, these were important figures. But privately, what she loved were the entertainers who came to Windsor Castle to entertain the royal family. I, I wanted I the book it. to make people smile, yeah. laugh, realise who she was. She had a sense of humour, but she wasn't frivolous. She, she took serious things seriously. And you mentioned how she'd met everyone. Yeah. And she was very careful. She would never betray who she liked most because she was very even-handed. Uh, two things to say to you. One is I remember going to the Royal Variety Show with her, sitting in the Royal Box. And the Duke of Edinburgh, if he liked an act, would be loud in his applause. And then he'd look at the programme and say, oh, not Elton John again. <laughs> but the Queen was very even-handed, gave everyone the same amount of applause. And I said to her at the interval, you seem to enjoy the first half very much, which I did. I said, you seem to enjoy every act equally. Did you? And she said, well, perhaps not entirely, but I, I like to applaud everybody in case, because this is on television, in case their families are looking. Oh. And, and she, she Actually, was, that's really considerate. She but... was very thoughtful like that. And the only exception I found 
when trying to tease out of her who that she'd met that was particularly interesting or memorable. And she had met everybody, from Marilyn Monroe and Frank Sinatra through to Madonna and even Vladimir Putin. She'd met everybody. The one exception to mentioning somebody that she would give would be Nelson Mandela. Uh, and she admired him so much, and she said this, because he had emerged from 27 years in prison without any rancor. You wrote several very moving pieces when she died, uh, and obviously the book is now here before us and, and uh, people will reflect upon the content of it. But I'm going to eyeball you as an old chum and simply ask you this. What is your personal tribute to her? What I think is remarkable about the Queen is that it's her personality, her nature, her values that we want to remember and cherish. When she died, there were uh, in London on that day for her funeral, more heads of state, more prime ministers, more presidents than ever, had ever gathered in any one city before at any one time. When Queen Victoria died, the world mourned. She was then our longest reigning sovereign, but she had executive power. She could do things. The Queen couldn't do anything. The Queen could only be what she was. And, uh, you know, when Queen Victoria died, we were the number one country. Now we're the 21st most populous country in the world, sixth largest GDP. And yet, that woman personified the best of British. So, what's not to be grateful for? And to have lived such a long life, and to have been so consistent, to have been an exemplar of goodness, well, it's fantastic. You said earlier that, that she was very clear in conversation with you and others that she owed so much to her father, who she adored, uh, but the philosophy, the, the rules of engagement uh, of, of, of the job, she got a lot of it. Um, it struck me very powerfully from the moment of Charles becoming King Charles III that he drew so much from his mother. I mean, that very first speech to the nation she could have written. It was an echo of one of her most famous speeches, uh, and it was remarkable. Was that recognition of what you can learn from Mater and Pater and passed down through the generations perhaps one of her greatest gifts to him? Well, I think the way the transition has happened has been brilliant. I mean, he hit the ground, not running, but obviously mourning, and yet he said all the right things on the first day. And I thought, yes, it's going to be all right. And also he made it crystal clear that he was going to be a constitutional monarch. Nothing ever is you know, set in stone. There will be changes. But basically, he is taking on from her, just as the Queen Consort is taking on from the Duke of Edinburgh. At that birthday lunch that I referred to, she said that she was going to follow his rule. Look up, look out, say less, do more, get on with the job. That's what they're both going to do. And I wish them all the best of luck. May I just say thank you for your friendship and loyalty over many, many years and for your kind support of GB News, upon which you appear as often as we ask you to, which is lovely. And I'm May we wish you a very happy Christmas. And, and I'd like to wish year. you a very happy Christmas, a peaceful new year, and whichever of us two lives the longest um, will be there to make the tributes. So if Alistair goes before I do, I should be saying some very nice words about him. But if I go before you do, I'd be I should be delighted to reciprocate or, or get just a little ahead of him. Uh, but I'm not going to open a book on the odds. Giles Brandreth, God bless. Thank you so much.